Becoming a Muslim Part 3 The Special Rewards and Circumstances for the Convert There are some statements of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, that demonstrate that there are some special rewards and circumstances for the Muslim convert. In general, an individual will enter Islam while his past will be filled with both good and evil deeds. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, has explained what will happen to the individual with respect to those previous deeds. Al-Bukhari records in his collection of authentic hadith. Hakim ibn Hizam said, O Messenger of Allah, what do you think about the acts of worship I used to perform in the pre-Islamic days of freeing slaves? Keeping the ties of kinship and giving in charity? Will I receive any reward for that? The Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, told him. You have embraced Islam upon what good you had in the past. The comments to be presented concerning this hadith are based on Ahmad ibn Hajjah, Fath al-Bari by Shah Sahih al-Bukhari, Beirut. Dar al-Marida, Vol 3, pp 302-303, Bad al-Din al-Aini, Umda al-Kari, Beirut, Da Ihyar al-Tarath, Vol 8, p 303. One interpretation of this hadith is that the individual will be rewarded for the good that he did in the past and this reward is due to his embracing of Islam. It must be noted, though, that the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, did not explicitly tell him that he will be rewarded for those actions that he did before becoming a Muslim. In order for a deed to be acceptable to Allah, it must be done with the proper intention of pleasing Allah and with the certainty that it is correct according to Allah's laws. These two conditions, obviously, are generally missing when discussing the deeds of disbelievers. Hence, others interpret this hadith in different ways. One explanation is that those good deeds have developed a good character in the person and demonstrates a leaning toward doing good that he will greatly benefit from by now being a Muslim. This tendency toward doing good may have been what led him to Islam. In fact, it may have been because of those deeds that Allah blessed him by guiding him to Islam. The hadith may also mean that the person will still be rewarded for those deeds but in this world. This is part of the great mercy and justice of Islam that he does not allow any good deed to go unrewarded. Although such good deeds done by non-Muslims may not meet the conditions of being rewarded by Allah in the hereafter, Allah does not ignore them and gives to such unbelievers in this life. Hence, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, said, the disbeliever is rewarded in this life by provisions for what he has done of good deeds. Recorded by Muslim. However, there is yet another statement of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, that clearly states that if a person converts to Islam and does his best to complete and perfect his faith, he will indeed be rewarded for the deeds that he performed before becoming a Muslim. This seems to be a special bounty that Allah has chosen to bestow upon such people and Allah bestows his bounty upon whom he wills. The text of this hadith reads. If a servant accepts Islam and completes his Islam, Allah will record for him every good deed that he performed before his Islam, and Allah will erase for him every evil deed that he did before his Islam. Then everything after that will be according to a retribution. For every good deed, he will be recorded tenfold up to seven hundredfold. And for every evil deed he will be recorded similarly, one, for it, unless Allah overlooks that for him. Recorded by Malik and Al-Nasari. According to Al-Albani, it is Sahi. Al-Albani, Sahi al-Jami, Vol 1, p. 122. This hadith shows that a person will be rewarded for the good deeds that he performed before becoming Muslim. His evil deeds will also be erased after becoming Muslim. However, this is conditional. This is conditional upon the fact that he perfects or completes his Islam. That is, it is conditional that he remain away from the evil deeds after he becomes a Muslim. This understanding is further supported by a hadith in both Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim in which Ibn Masud asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, if they were to be held accountable for the deeds that they performed in pre-Islamic times. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, told him, as for the one of you who excels in Islam, he will not be held accountable for it. As for the one who does evil, with respect to his Islam, he shall be held accountable for what he did in pre-Islamic times as well as in Islam. There is also a hadith in Musnad Ahmed which states, while the Prophet, peace be upon him, was speaking to Amr ibn Allah's, O Amr. Didn't you know that Islam wipes away all of the sins that one performed before it? This narration is from Musnad Ahmed. Sai Muslim has virtually the same with a slight change in the wording. This hadith must be understood in the light of the previously mentioned hadith. If a person completes his Islam and excels in Islam, then all of his previous sins will be erased and overlooked. 
Otherwise, if he continues to perform such evil acts in Islam, his previous acts will not be overlooked, Ibn Rajab, Jami, Vol. 1, p. 296, however. This only applies to sins and evil deeds with respect to Allah. It does not include obligations that one still has to fulfill, such as debts or crimes that one may be punished for in this world. Furthermore, there is even a stronger passage in the Quran. Allah says, those who do not call on any other deity besides Allah, may he be glorified, nor kill any person. Whose killing Allah has prohibited except for that which Allah has allowed such as the killing of a murderer, renegade or a married adulterer, nor commit adultery. Whoever does these major sins will face the punishment for the sin he has committed on the day of judgment. The punishment will be doubled for him on the day of judgment, and he will remain in the punishment, disgraced and humiliated. But those who repent to Allah and do good deeds that indicate the sincerity of their repentance, then Allah will change the evil deeds of such people into good ones. Allah is forgiving of the sins of those of his servants who repent and he is merciful towards them. 25.68-70 Some scholars feel that that verse implies that previous evil deeds will be turned into good deeds. However, some say that it means that the person will then do good deeds in this life. Yet others say that it means that in the hereafter the evil deeds will be transformed and the person will be rewarded for them due to the worry and remorse that he suffered because of them after. Becoming a Muslim In sum, the new Muslim convert is facing a very great opportunity. He is being given the opportunity to have all of his previous ills and sins immediately cancelled while possibly still being rewarded for good that he did before embracing Islam. This is part of Allah's grace and mercy. It is conditional though. The convert must take his Islam seriously, practice it properly and be a true Muslim while keeping himself from falling into the evils that he practiced before becoming a Muslim. If he somehow allows himself to fall back into his evil practices of old, he then loses a great opportunity that Allah has graciously offered him. Finally, there is a verse in the Quran and another hadith that deals specifically with the members of the people of the book who convert to Islam. These people believed in earlier books and earlier prophets and then took the further necessary step of also believing wholeheartedly in the final prophet and book that their own prophets and books alluded to. Allah says about them. I continuously conveyed to the idolaters and the Jews amongst the people of the book the word regarding the stories of the previous nations and the punishment I sent down on them when they denied my messengers, in the hope that they will be reminded by this and then believe, so that they are not afflicted by what afflicted them. Those who were firm in believing the Torah before the Qur'an was revealed believe in the Qur'an, due to them finding it being informed of and described in their books. When it is recited to them they say, we believe it is the truth in which there is no doubt and which is revealed from our Lord. We were Muslims before this Qur'an was revealed, due to our faith in what the messengers before him brought. Those who have been described as mentioned will be given the reward of their actions by Allah twice. Due to their persevering in faith in their own book and due to their faith in Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he was sent. They repel through the good of their righteous actions the sins they earned, and from what I have provided them they spend in the avenues of good. 28.51-54 The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, also said, there are three who will receive their rewards twice. One of them is, a believer from the people of the book who believed in his Prophet and then also believed in Muhammad. He will receive two rewards. Recorded by al-Bukhari and Muslim. Some scholars argue that this hadith refers only to Christians who convert to Islam because the message of the Prophet Jesus had abrogated the message of the earlier prophets. In other words, the Jew who rejects Jesus, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, does not truly believe in his own prophets because Jesus was also sent to the tribe of Israel. His rejecting of Jesus implies his rejection of what his own prophet has brought. Hence, he is not a true believer and the words of the hadith above do not apply to him. The Prophet's words, though, are more general than that and should be understood in its general sense. Furthermore, it is confirmed that the verses quoted above applied equally to the Jews and Christians. See Ibn Hajar, Fath, Vol. 1, pp. 190-191. A convert's wealth earned prior to Islam. When a non-Muslim embraces Islam, it is very likely that some portion of his wealth has come from sources that Islam considers illegitimate. For example, the convert could have money that resulted from interest-bearing transactions and investment, selling or serving alcohol and so on. 
What should the new Muslim then do with such wealth that is already in his possession? For more details on this issue, see Abbas al-Bas, Akam al-Mail al-Haram. What should the new Muslim then do with such wealth that is already in his possession? For more details on this issue, see Abbas al-Bas, Akam al-Mail al-Haram, Arman, Jordan. Da al-Nafais, 1999, pp 121-134. Al-Bas' work is the main reference for this section. The general rule is that any wealth that one has in one's possession at the time of conversion remains the property of the convert regardless of how that wealth was gained. As long as it was gained in a legal fashion according to the laws the convert was living by. The individual is not held responsible for his lack of applying Islamic principles prior to his conversion. Thus, for example, Allah says, Those who take interest will rise from their graves on the day of resurrection like a person who is afflicted by Satan. They will stand up from their graves and then fall like a person who is epileptic. This is because they made usury, reba, permissible and made no distinction between usury and that which Allah has permitted in terms of profit earned through sales transactions. They claimed, sale is like usury, meaning that both are lawful since both lead to an increase in wealth. Allah refutes their comparison and explains that he has permitted sale because of the general and specific benefit it contains. And he has prohibited usury because it is oppressive and abusive of people's wealth. The person who stops taking usury, and repents from his sin, after receiving Allah's instruction prohibiting it and warning him against it, may keep the usury that he received in the past. Without any sin. Then, whatever he does from then on, Allah will judge it. Whoever returns to taking usury after knowing of the prohibition deserves to enter the fire of hell and to remain there eternally. The reference to remaining in the fire of hell eternally in relation to those that believe in Allah's oneness is an indication of a long period of time. For only disbelievers will actually remain eternally in the fire hell. 2 275. This verse demonstrates that Allah overlooks the actions that one performs before the rulings reach him and he is obligated to follow such regulations. Numerous people embraced Islam during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, yet there is no record of him asking any of them about the wealth in their possession and how they obtained such wealth. Indeed, even marriages that took place before the conversion were not questioned or examined to see if their contracts met the Islamic standards. In fact, there are various reports that demonstrate that the Prophet explicitly approved of the converts keeping the wealth in their possession. Actually, the person earned such wealth believing that there was nothing wrong with what they were doing. Hence, they are allowed to keep such wealth. Their case is different from a Muslim who knowingly deals in alcohol, for example. Such a Muslim, even after repenting from such an act, is not to keep that ill-earned wealth. However, the situation is different if the convert has, at the time of his conversion, not yet received money that is from a source that Islam considers illegitimate. For example, the individual could have sold and delivered someone alcohol on July 1st but the agreement between them is that he is not to be paid until December 1st. In the meantime, say in September, the one who sold the alcohol converts to Islam. It is possible to look at this and say that since the contract was concluded before his conversion, he is still entitled to this money, as this is wealth he earned before becoming Muslim. However, the majority of the scholars state that he no longer has the right to that money. They quote, those who after receiving direction from their Lord, desist, shall be pardoned for the past, 2 275, once again. Now, the admonition has come to him and he can only keep what he received earlier and must forego anything additional. Allah also says. If you do not obey the sacred law, then be aware and certain of war with Allah and his messenger. If you repent to Allah and leave usury, reba, then you can keep the initial amount that you had given as a loan from your capital. In a manner that does not wrong anyone by taking more than your initial capital and does not wrong you by making you receive less than it, 2 colon 2 79. Thus, for example, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, abolished all of the interest-bearing agreements during a speech in Mecca after many people had just embraced Islam. 
Hence, although those contracts were concluded before they had embraced Islam, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, clearly voided the forbidden aspect of the contract. In sum, once an individual embraces Islam he should from that moment on forego and not accept any wealth that is earned through forbidden means. Regardless of whether the contract for that wealth took place before his conversion. Actually, now the individual should believe that such money is forbidden and therefore he himself should no longer wish to receive it or benefit from it. Given the nature of contracts nowadays, he may not be able to cancel the contract. If he is forced to receive such money, he should give it away and free himself from it. Many mosques have specific accounts for monies received through illegitimate means but which one is forced to receive, such as interest on deposits. And will use that money is very specific ways as recommended by the scholars. Pre-Islamic marriages There is no question that Islam affirms the marriages that took place outside of Islam or before a person embraced Islam. The evidence for this is numerous. For example, in Surah Al-Masad, Allah refers to the wife of Abu Lahab, the Prophet's uncle who vigorously opposed him, as well as to the wife of the Pharaoh. Numerous companions of the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, were born before the advent of Islam and they were considered legitimate children of their parents. Indeed, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, never ordered married companions to remarry within Islam. In fact, the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, did not even ask them about the circumstances of their marriage contract, such as whether there were witnesses and so forth. However, those relationships that were considered illegitimate by a convert's previous religion or law are also considered illegitimate in Islam. Thus, for example, one's illegitimate child before embracing Islam remains illegitimate after one's embracing of Islam, compared to Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah. Akam al al Dimah, Damam, Saudi Arabia. Zamadi Liel Nasha, 1997, Vol. 2, pp. 764f, on the other hand. Any children born via a legitimate pre Islamic marriage will be considered legitimate children and continue to be the children of the Muslim convert. One exception to this general principle of affirming pre Islamic marriages is where the husband and wife are within the prohibited degrees of marriage. Thus, for example, in ancient Persia, brothers and sisters could marry one another. Such a marriage would be considered void as soon as either of the couple embraced Islam. Furthermore, in a polygynous situation, if a man is married to more than four wives, upon embracing Islam he must separate from some of them and may have, at the most, only four wives. Some other important issues related to conversion to Islam must be touched upon. If a husband and a wife both embrace Islam at approximately the same time, then their marriage remains intact and there is no need for them to take any further steps. If a man who is married to either a Christian or Jewish woman embraces Islam, the marriage also remains intact and there is also no need for any further steps, this is based on the verse. Today Allah has allowed you to eat those things that are wholesome, and the animals slaughtered by the Jews and Christians who are the people of the scripture. He has also made lawful for them animals that you slaughter. He has permitted you to marry free, chaste women from the believers, as well as free, chaste women from the Jews and Christians who received scripture before you. This is if you give them their dowries and you are trying to stay away from committing an immoral action, such as adultery or fornication, by taking them as lovers. Yet whosoever disbelieves in Allah and his laws which he has given to his slaves, then his actions are void, because the condition for good actions to be accepted is true faith. On the day of judgment, such a person will be a loser due to entering the fire of hell, where they will live eternally. 5 colon 5 those cases are clear and non-problematic. The problematic cases are, 1, a male convert married to a woman who is not Christian, Jewish or accepting of Islam. 2, a female convert married to a non-Muslim husband, although there is a great deal of difference of opinion concerning some of these issues. The author is following the conclusions reached by Ibn al-Qayyim in Akam al Aldima, volume. 2, pp 640-695. Ibn al-Qayyim has discussed these questions in great detail and has supported his opinion with strong, conclusive arguments. The pertinent verses of the Quran related to these issues are as follows, Allah says. O you who have faith in Allah, and who act on what he has ordained for you, when believing women come to you as emigrants from the land of disbelief to the land of Islam. Then test them with respect to the sincerity of their faith. Allah knows best about their faith, nothing of what their hearts contain is hidden from him. If you are sure of their being believers after such a test that makes their sincerity apparent to you, then do not send them back to their disbelieving husbands. 
it is not lawful for believing women to be married to disbelievers and it is not lawful for disbelievers to marry believing women. Give their husbands the dowry that they paid. There is no sin on you, O believers, if you marry them after their waiting period is over if you give them their dowry. The person whose wife is a disbeliever or who turned away from Islam, then he should not retain her, because their marriage has terminated by her disbelief. 60 colon 10. Allah also says. Do not get married, O believers, to those women who give partners to Allah until they have faith in him alone and enter the path of Islam. A woman who is a slave but has faith in Allah and his messenger is better than a free woman who worships idols, even though you may be impressed by her beauty and wealth. Do not give Muslim women in marriage to men who are idolaters. A slave man who has faith in Allah and his messenger is better than a free man who is an idolater, even though he may seem impressive to you. Men and women who commit idolatry, invite by their statements and actions, towards that which will lead to entering the fire of hell. Allah, on the other hand, invites to good actions which will lead to entry into paradise and forgiveness of sins by his permission and grace. Allah makes his verses clear for people so that they may learn and act obediently. 2 221. According to Ibn al qayyim when a woman married to a non-Muslim convert to Islam, the marriage becomes suspended and non-binding. In other words, she no longer is his wife in the sense of having marital relations or him being financially responsible for her, he is not financially responsible for her because she is the one choosing this option. While at the same time she is not making herself available to him as a wife, however. The woman is free to choose between ending the marriage, thereby being free to marry somebody else but only after her waiting period is finished, or suspending the marriage in the sense of waiting. For her husband to embrace Islam. In the latter case, whenever the man embraces Islam, the woman automatically returns to him as a wife with no need for a new marriage contract. Even if the husband's conversion took place many years after that of the wife. The strongest evidence for this conclusion is the case of the Prophet's own daughter, Zainab. She embraced Islam but her husband, Abu Alayyaz ibn al-Rabi, refused to do so for many years. Then, finally, after six years, he came to Medina and the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, reunited the couple without a new marriage contract or dawah, Ibn al qayyim volume. Two P. six fifty also presents a story in which Zainab's husband was coming to Medina and she asked the Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, whether he could stay at her residence. The Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, told her, he is your husband but he cannot be in, physical, contact with you. This demonstrates that the marriage is suspended. It is neither a full marriage nor are the two completely separated. Unfortunately, though, this author was not able to trace this story through any other sources besides this reference. If a man embraces Islam and his wife is not a Muslim, Jew or Christian, then his retaining her as a wife will be harmful to her as he will not be allowed to have marital relations with her or treat her as a full wife. Thus, in this case, the marriage comes to an end if the woman refuses to embrace Islam. Allah says, likewise hold not the disbelieving women as wives, 60 colon 10. Changing one's name upon becoming a Muslim. It has become common practice in some areas for converts to change their names upon becoming Muslims. Sometimes this is done so that the convert feels more attached and affiliated with a Muslim community. The obvious question that arises is, is this changing of the name required, recommended or simply permissible? On this point, Abdulaziz ibn Baz stated in response to a question he had received. I inform you that there is no evidence in Islamic law that requires one whom Allah has guided to Islam to change his name to an Islamic name. The exception is if, there is an Islamic reason that requires that. For example, if a person has a name implying the worship of someone other than Allah, such as the servant of Jesus and so forth. Or if the person has a name that is not good to have and there are better names than that. Such as the name Grievous can be changed to Mild. Similar is the case with any other name that is not considered proper for one to be named. However, it is obligatory to change the name that implies worshipping other than Allah. Concerning other, repugnant, names, then it is simply preferred and recommended to change such names. Included in this second category of names are those names that are well known to be Christian names such that if one hears them he will think that the person must be a Christian. 
To change one's name under those circumstances is good, Ali Abu Laws, compiler, answers to common questions from new Muslims, and Arba, Michigan, IANA, 1995, pp 22-23. Below Phillips has some further insight into this question. New Muslims, unaware of the Islamic naming system, the Islamic naming system that he is referring to is wherein the person is known as, so and so the son of so and so. After that, a tribal or regional name may also be added, often adopt Arabic names in the chaotic European style. In fact, those of African descent often erase even their family names on the basis that these names are remnants from the days of slavery. That is, those of their ancestors who were slaves usually adopted the family name of their slave masters and it was the slave master's name which was handed down from generation to generation. Hence, an individual who may have been called Clive Baron Williams while his father's name was George Herbert Williams may, upon entering Islam, rename himself Faisal Uman Krum Ahmadi. However, his name according to the Islamic naming system should have been Faisal George Williams, that is, Faisal the son of George Williams. Whether Williams was the name of his ancestor's plantation owner or not is of no consequence. Since his father's name was George Williams, he is, according to the Islamic naming system, the son of George Williams. The practice among new Muslims of deleting their family names has frequently created deep resentment among their non-Muslim families which could have been easily avoided. If the Islamic naming system had been adopted. Actually, the new Muslim is under no obligation to change even his or her Christian name unless it contains a UN Islamic meaning. Thus, the given name Clive, which means cliff dweller need not have been changed whereas Dennis, Fr. Denies, a variation of Dionysius which means he of Dionys, the Greek god of wine and fertility who was worshipped with orgiastic rites, would have to be changed. However, it is perfectly acceptable for a Muslim, whether a recent convert or not, to change his or her first name. It was the Prophet's practice to change people's first names if they were too assuming, negative or UNL Islamic. One of the Prophet's wives was originally named Barra, Pious, and he changed it to Zainab as Allah had said in the Quran. So do not claim purity for your souls by praising them and asserting their piety. He, may he be glorified, knows best about those who are mindful of him, by fulfilling his instructions and avoiding his prohibitions, 53 32. However, Allah's messenger never changed the names of people's fathers, no matter how UN Islamic they may have been. Thus, it can be concluded that erasing one's family name is against both the letter and the spirit of Islamic law. The father's first and last name should be retained and if the father is unknown, the mother's first and last name should follow the Muslim's given or chosen name, Bilal Phillips. Tafsir of Surah al-Hujurat, Riyadh, International Islamic Publishing House, 1988, pp 120-122.